Hello and welcome to the CNBC Africa special. I'm Ropwa Madzena. Now, technology is fundamentally changing the way business is done in tourism across the African continent. And this year's Tourism in Daba, which was hosted in the city of Durban, dissected the increasing role of technology in travel. A panel of key industry players, including Stephen Eckberg from Travel Start, Yolisa Kani of Uber, Stephanie Hodges from Airbnb, Angelica Koch from Emadeus IT Group, Victor Tarage from the Department of Tourism, Chipiwa Chipengwa from Fedesa, and McLean Sabanda from the Innovation Group discussed this and began with an analysis of where Africa currently stands. So, you know, where are we now? I think we are just uh, in the beginning of something um, that's going to change the world, you know, completely. You know, we're just on the verge of, you know, seeing artificial intelligence, you know, making, you know, major inroads into our lives and, um, you know, voice recognition and all this. The, the, the way that how we did things in the past is going to change. So, you know, of course, that's going to be very, very hard for us to uh, keep up with. And uh, I heard this, um, you know, expression here before we were talking about technological divide. And, uh, and of course, that's, you know, that's, that's also going to in increase quite, quite a bit. But, you know, with this, you know, I think there are um, a lot of opportunities for, for everybody. And I think for, uh, for the, uh, you know, the distinguished audience here today, I think um, it's, it's more about, you know, really embracing change and not trying to resist it. You know, that would be probably my number one advice in, in when it comes to, for, for all of us, actually. So, um, you know, look at what your kids are doing. And if you're older, look at what your grandkids are doing and then just try to, you know, download all, all those stupid apps that they're using and learn from them. If I could just start from the beginning. I mean, if you look at where we come from, from a public transport point of view, probably less than 50 years ago, there's only two modes of public transport that were dominant, which was the subsidized buses as well as the metro rail. Fast forward to where we are today, you are able to use your cell phone to call for a vehicle at whatever time you want and when, wherever you are. So I'd like to believe that, um, I guess we're at a point, this is the cusp of things that are yet to come. And I guess yet again, technology has enabled us not to necessarily predict the future, but at least to be able to, to pick up the trends so that we can better plan for whatever the future looks like, which is something that we most definitely don't know. If you had asked us another 20 years ago if things would be happening in the manner in which they're happening today, the answer would have been never. If somebody says, do you think we'll ever be commuting with drones, I bet half the room will say never. But with technology, I guess it's everything and anything is possible. So from where I'm sitting, I'm super excited to be sitting in a, in, in, a, in a world and a space where also whatever choices I make, at least they're, they're informed by real-time uh, information. In other words, if I want to book a hotel, I'm not just relying on what the hotelier is saying, I can rely on your reviews, which would probably be more accurate. So I guess it's about choices and it's, it's about all of this information being much more available than it was before. I was rather encouraged in listening to the Deputy Minister talking about technology as a means of developing new solutions and services to drive the growth of tourism. I think that's fantastic. And I could go on to give examples, but I think my colleagues in this panel have got great examples. From our vantage point, as a technology provider sitting at the heart of the travel ecosystem, connecting buyers with sellers, sorry, providers with sellers and buyers, what we see is that technology can even go further, drive transformational growth. We're already seeing how it can grow. We're already seeing how it can develop. But are, is it touching the depths of our communities? Is it transforming the way our people are living in our countries? I think that is one of the key roles that technology can do enable transformation or growth. The potential for inclusion in the tourism industry is just tremendous, particularly for emerging markets. Um, what I should just say there is that we launched 
experiences in 12 markets across the world, and two of them were right here in Africa, in Cape Town and Nairobi, and those are by far our most exciting and coveted experiences. Um, just about our homes, um, we have 16,000 hosts across South Africa, hosting around 16 days a year, earning around 28,000 rand, so that's a little bit of extra income uh, that can go a long way. I live in London and I host you know, around five to seven days a year, and that helps pay for my daughter's nursery. It's just a little bit extra, but again, it can go a long way. Um, our community of hosts and guests contributed over two billion to the economic, um, sort of, um, contributed two billion economic activity in South Africa last year. Finally, just going back to my role, it's really about working with governments all across the world and identifying how Airbnb can support the broader tourism agenda. In London, over the past two years, we've been working on a program called the London Cultural Program. And that's really in partnership with the city to drive more people into outer, outer skirts of the city, into cultural institutions that wouldn't usually see tourist footprint uh, and economic spending. And here in Cape Town, um, we've, we have two exciting programs. One's in the township of Langa, and another one's with Open Africa. And it's really about how do we bring along more people, how do we address barriers to hosting, and um, you know, we hope to expand those learnings to more places, particularly in rural areas across the country. I think the first question, Siki, that you asked was, so where are we? Uh, I'm probably the only panel member here who comes from government side. So probably what we are at at this moment is, is a bit of a catch-up game. And a catch-up game in the sense that if you look globally, there isn't anyone who was really ready for all the various disruptive technologies that came in. So everybody had to actually respond subsequently. And as we're doing that, technology developments are not going to wait for that. So they, there's going to be a perpetual catch-up game. But I want to underline that to say that technology is an absolute necessity. So we, we are not going to be going back. We have got to move with the times. It has brought about speed, very good speed in terms of uh, doing business. Uh, it has brought about efficiencies, very good efficiencies. It has brought about good access in terms of markets and so on, whether you're talking about products that are in areas that ordinarily would not necessarily have such access and so on. But most importantly, it has also lessened the burden in terms of being able to get into certain markets. So if you're talking about someone who's going to list with either Airbnb or Uber and so on, they'll be able to get into that space. For us, though, the most important thing is that there has got to be sustainability of such initiatives. Because in the end, the needs are not changing. The needs remain the same. So these technologies that come as disruptive technologies, all that they are doing is simply to take existing needs and bring the consumer in a different way from the manner in which these things were offered before. But in doing so, we need to then recognize the environment within which we're doing this and what sort of impacts these have. And governments have got a role to play in that particular space. I think, uh, you know, when I was invited on this topic, I was reminded of the time when I went to school in the late 90s, when we were studying tourism everything was in a paper format. We were learning how to issue paper tickets, you know, how do you manually do things. And uh, I remember on the final year, they said, well, you've got to take a course. It's called Galileo or Amadeus. Then all that work that we did for the whole year, we did it in two weeks. <laughs> and we were told that we were, we were qualified. So technology has revolutionized the way travel is done from the retail side of things you know, when, if you were a travel agent in the 90s, and if you are a travel agent now, it's like a night and day. Uh, things are now issued online. Uh, you know, there is automation on the back office. Invoicing is done online and so forth and so on. The same applies to the hotels. You know, check-in is done automatically. Your details are stored and so forth and so on. 
So technology has came in and has changed the way we do things in travel, but it also came with challenges. Because, you know, if you look at South Africa, we are, and you look at the, at the tourism industry, it's a labor-intensive industry. This is where we create jobs. Now, when technology comes, you know, there are certain jobs that, you know, will be lost to technology. Mm -hmm. You know, and the challenge is how do we then, you know, as we advance in technology, how do we make sure that, you know, we still create jobs, number one, and also we advance in technology. And I think that's one of the biggest challenge. And we have seen with you know, all these technologies that came into the market, uh, the, the sharing economy technologies, um, we have seen you know, uh, you know, within the hotel space, you know, occupancy rates starting to you know, get shaken. And we've seen uh, you know, other things that have happened with the, in the market. And I think the challenge, you know, I guess within Africa is to say that you know, with the changes in technology, with the advancement in technology, how do we then balance, you know, the human resources that we have? How do we then change and how do we create policies, you know, that will ensure that, you know, we don't lose, you know, those human resources, you know, because of technology? Is it the reskilling and what kind of reskilling is needed? And I think it's something that we, we, we need to look at and also to level the playing field. You know, everyone who operates within, you know, a, a business space, you know, especially here in South Africa, there are certain rules and regulations that we all need to follow. Big businesses, small businesses, we all have to pay tax, for example. So it is something that, you know, we also need to look at and say, you know, are we all playing by the same rules? You know, is the level playing field equal? Uh, so that we don't get to a situation where you get, you know, the, the so-called traditional players starting to question whether following the rules is the right thing, or they should be getting outside of the rules uh, and, and, you know, get outside of the industry, you know, uh, uh, specific regulations. The beauty of technology is that it allows its innovators to come up with products and services people never knew they needed, but they are often met with opposition from various stakeholders, and the conversation continues as to how to deal with this opposition. Well, I mean, you know, that's quite easy. I mean, look at Airbnb and Uber. I mean, I, I don't know how many lawyers you guys employ, but I mean, it must be hundreds and hundreds of them, you know, just to keep your guys, you know, out of jail all the time. So, yes, of course, you know, the technology companies uh, move a lot faster and, you know, consumer adoption, you know, is, is so fast um, that, you know, regulators, you know, they, they're trying to uh, catch up. But, um, but, you know what, that's... You know, uh, in, in, in every paradigm shift we have in society, it's always like that. So, so that's, you know, nothing new. And that's what I, you know, in my sort of, you know, opening statement here said, you know, we just need, need to have an open mind about and not trying to, you know, resist change because th th that's just ridiculous. And we're, we're you know, we're all going to lose if we try to resist that. So, so um, you know, I look at that in ev everything that we do in, you know, our part of the industry, you know, so many, so many companies are trying to come up with clever, you know, ways to do stuff and sell it to people while, you know, the consumers, they'll just, they are like a, f you know, flood wave, you know, they just move their own direction. So I think the best thing to do is just put on your life vest and just, you know, go with the flow there. I think the first acknowledgement we've done as a company is that the fact that Uber started in America and that's, that's what we saw, the first cars running in, in SF and in Paris. And when it started in South Africa in 2010, the biggest lesson we had to learn and pretty fast is that you don't take what's happening there and just superimpose it in another market and think it's going to work. That's number one. Number two, you also have to understand the market in which you're operating because even in the sub-Sahara, South African, South Africa, the South African market is nowhere near the, the East Africa and the West African market. So basics that we, we had to get those right. Unfortunately, in this case, regulations were not ready for e-hailing platforms to a point where it was difficult to define what this business is. Is it a taxi? If it's a taxi, what type of a taxi is it? Is it a meter taxi? To a point where right now we're sitting at a subcategory under meter taxi. Depending on the stakeholder you're speaking to, some are more uh, averse around that uh, definition, some welcome it. But bottom line is, the only way 
was to actually have these very difficult and frank, frank conversations with the regulators to say, it's truly and honestly no longer about Uber, the company. It's about what the commuter wants. Forget how we feel about each other. How do we react to the commuter's need? Because if you look at the Uber market, it was not necessarily somebody who used public transport or even a meter taxi on a daily basis. Yeah. It was a new market altogether. So I guess the, the, the winning point was how do we meet each other halfway? Bottom line is economic opportunities have been created, but they can't be created in a vacuum. So I guess at some point we had to lock, it's not yet Uhuru, but we had to lock ourselves in a room and say, how do we make this work? How do we make sure that the most important stakeholder in this case, other than the regulator, which is your traditional meter taxis and minibus taxi, how do we help them understand that if only they could leverage yeah. on this technology, that could multiply their business, that could open new markets. So, and it's not a conversation you have overnight and thanks by things are done. Yeah. It is continuous because by the time we have a meeting next month, there's a new technology in the room. Let me go back to the concept of disruption. Because sometimes we, we confuse the sharing economy with disruption. You know that people need accommodation. You know that people need transportation. You then go and study how you could also provide for another segment of people who need such services, but who, according to the current uh, supply chain, let me call it that, are not able to actually get into that particular space. Same thing, whether it is uh, the bookings that you could do through other platforms, whether it's uh, Amadeus and so on. So. It's, it's that same person who would have sold you a ticket, so you, you stay in a village somewhere, you've got to make a phone call, go to the nearest town, and they tell you, no, they, this travel agency actually will print the ticket only in the next city, not in the town. And, 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 yeah. But now you would be able to do this thing at your own convenience at home, so you supply a certain segment. Once you get into supplying that particular segment, Everybody else who was using the traditional means looks at these things, sees the convenience I was talking about, sees the speed I was talking about, and all the other good aspects that come with it. When that happens, that is when the problems start for your Ubers. That's when the problem starts uh, with uh, the, 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 the associations in the accommodation industry together with your uh, Airbnb. Now, there, there are a few issues here that, that really require uh, more, you know, deeper, thorough understanding. Why wait for government to come in and say, please do one, two, three? If you know you are a responsible corporate, come in and make sure that what you're bringing in, because you know it's a disruptor it's already taking into account those elements. So if you look at uh, the, the, the Airbnb, and I'm gonna finish this now, you've got very clear indications. I mean, last year, uh, there was an indication that there's a, one uh, of your clients in this city who's got about 12 rooms, and throughout the duration of Indaba was actually accommodating people there. That's okay but this is not a business. Now what the local government knows is that the bulk facilities that are provided to that particular household are meant for people that just live there. It's a you know, fairly uh, you know, organized arrangement and so on. You are parking 12, 15 cars in that particular area. They're using the same road on a daily basis. Yeah. And you are actually not making a single contribution to making sure that that road is well maintained through the money that you're also paying in the rates and so on and so forth. And at the same time, it doesn't necessarily lead directly to employment. And we would like to see growth that actually brings employment as well. So these are the issues that we would like to go into a dialogue, a serious dialogue and say, how then do we best make sure that it's a win-win situation? 
and there is no loser in this process. I think you, 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 you've nailed it. All these technologies that are coming up are coming up because the traveler wants to be served this way. The traveler is a heart, at the heart of travel and tourism. We like it or not, this is for them. Right? But that for one part. The other part also, the technology companies, by their nature, they're there to innovate, create new solutions, new services. Right? So what would bring all this together in a more ethical, responsible way is a new kind of partnership, a new kind of dialogue and cooperation between the public and the private sector. Right? Where while we attend to these urgent needs and these demands, these opportunities, this low-hanging fruit that is, exists, we also take stock and start thinking. First of all, let's understand, who is a traveler? We, I think we're making a mistake by thinking the traveler has got one profile, has got one set of needs. The same traveler may use different services depending on where they're traveling to, for business, family holiday, meeting up with friends over the weekend. My needs are completely different. I'll hop on a low-cost carrier, point to point, to meet with my old school friends. But when it's a long annual holiday, when I'm going back to the village, and I'm from Kenya and I live in Spain, believe me, I need a carrier that ensures that my bags are checked, that I have sufficient capacity, and a lot of other related services. So again, let's take stock, let's understand what does a traveler looking for, when they search where they're looking for, where are they coming from, when do they make the bookings, right? And then on the other hand also, what technologies exist? We've got cloud-based technologies that can allow travel businesses to serve travelers on the go, on their mobile phone. It is no longer a point of sitting at a terminal, at a computer, to serve the traveler, to print out a paper. So all this is changing. And we need to bring that together, sit down and analyze what do we have, in terms of technology, what are the traveler's needs? And then also look back and say, and what kind of tourism product do we have? What are the challenges in our countries? And how can we bring that together? I think that's where the responsibility comes from. The public sector cannot do it alone, and the private sector cannot do it alone either. They are successes, but they're isolated successes. Successes, sorry. Strong ones, good ones, but they're not that going back to that transformational growth I was talking about that technology can enable. And travel and tourism is the engine for that transformational growth. We're in conversations and we've had deals with over, I think, 350 jurisdictions across the world. And so you know, our job, when you ask sort of, how do we deal with, um, you know, when we confront regulation, we get to the table, we have dialogue. Uh, from our vantage point, it really is about growing the tourism pie, increasing the options for, um, for travelers, but most importantly, the people that are doing this are locals, so they're your community. So it really is about, you know, thinking about, you know, incentivizing. If you, if you want to see innovation, if you want to see entrepreneurship, then in the tourism industry is part of that. Um, you know, how, how, do you, how do you grow that as much as possible? Um, and obviously, responsibly. So again, it's about conversation. Um, and for us, again, about lowering, lowering the barriers to entry. We want to see as many people participating and, um, you know, diversifying what a place has to offer and benefiting from the tourism dollar spend. Um, you know, you can see in most of our major cities, I think 78% of the accommodation offer is outside the city center. That really is a very different offer than a city central hotel. The future of the industry is really going to be driven by the end user. And, and, <clears throat> and it's my view that even the, you know, the world of work will be different uh, 10 years from you know, from now than what we actually understand as work. Uh, you know, I foresee a future where people will be able to participate uh, instead of a job, but they would actually have work, but it won't be a job. But what does that mean? It means that even the tax man has got to uh, arise to, you know, to that particular change and figure out how, how is he going to collect taxes? Yeah you know, from these people that are making money in, 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 their, in their homes, but it's not a job in the, in the typical way that we know a job, and therefore they cannot be, you know, charged tax as it is currently classified. And I think from a regulatory point of view, it's really, I think there's a lot of 
innovation that needs to happen because you know, innovation is currently taking place and being driven largely by the end user. So it's more demand led. And in that particular regard, uh, because it's innovation, there's certain efficiencies that have been introduced. There's certain cost uh, benefits that currently are passing on to the consumer. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity even for the regulator to be able to, to exercise uh, almost similar kind of uh, you know, regulatory um, it constraints is those that are imposed on the traditional businesses, but allowing the industries to actually evolve. And if we take, for example, the Uber, it's cheaper for me to take an Uber from OR Tambo to my house than it is for me to take a normal meter taxi. Now, one can then look at, is this, is this registered? Are they, you know, do they have the right permits? Are they paying the right taxis? And pro possibly not. However, if one can be able to uh, factor in, a, in a, some percentage, um, it, 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 it's revenues that otherwise you'd not have collected. Because traditionally, I would not use an, a, a taxi. I would use my car. Uh, so it's really understanding, I think, what segment of the market we're actually serving. Is it a segment that previously we're collecting taxes and so forth? And I think from a, you know, regulating it uh, for, the, for the safety and the benefit uh, of the end user, uh, I think perhaps it's quite important for, uh, you know, for the regulators to also involve, uh, you know, the customer, the end user in the formulation of those particular, you know, regulations to say, you know, this is why we're doing this. How, how else can we actually do it better? I, I think whether we like it or not, there's going to be um, a lot of changes that are going to take place uh, in this particular industry. And, um, and, and somehow I think everybody you know, needs to be able to participate and, uh, and, and, and innovate. Now, as the CEO of the innovation, McLean Sabanda has highlighted, success in the tourism industry is not necessarily just government's responsibility. The responsibility falls on all involved stakeholders to ensure sustainable economic growth.